Liam, mate, welcome to the potty. Yeah, thanks for having me. Thanks for being here. Um, on the on the way here to the to the studio, I was looking through your some of your old speeches, and I saw your Victoria University graduation speech. Um, during that, you said that the only judgment that we have in life is the one that we put on ourselves before we die, and that just hit me pretty hard. I was wondering if you came to that realization from the adversity that you have faced, you know, as a as as a young person. Where yeah. did that come from? Uh, well, when I was 18, my mum died of cancer. And then six months before that, my uncle also died of cancer. So you spend a lot of time in hospices around people that are sort of about to kick the bucket. And you just kind of realize that they reflect. All they're doing is just pretty much sitting in a bed, waiting to die, reflecting on their life. And all of them go well, up both my mum and uncle and just like people I talked to in the hospice just kind of had very similar uh, sentiments towards like how they thought they went through mm. life and sort of judged themselves fairly or unfairly in certain circumstances. Mm. Mm. How did you, how did you find it, you know, growing up, your mum's, your mum's battling cancer. Um, I've heard through some other interviews, you know, you went through a pretty, pretty dark place when you had about, you know, 16, 18. How did you bounce through those, those times? You just keep going. That's literally it. Like, I don't have any secret formulas to like help people through those things. Uh, I think some things that would have helped in retrospect would have been not drinking a ton of, ton of alcohol and not smoking a ton of weed throughout my teen years. Um, but eh, life's just tough and you go through tough phases and you come out of them on the other side and you look back and at the end of the day, it's just time. Mm. Yeah. It, it certainly was extremely tough when I was 18. I moved to Perth. I was there with a couple of buddies. Um, I worked a really crappy job, just didn't really have like a future. Mum had just died. So that had a great deal of uncertainty mourning, um, just like a lot of different variables going on that made that point mm. in time pretty challenging. Mm. Did you, I, I also heard that you were keen to pick up your bags and move to Russia. At some point. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Um, what was that about? <clears throat> I had an event where I drunk drove when I was in my teen years uh, and uh, called some of my uh, friends at university uh, in the middle of the night and told them what had happened and said I was moving to Russia. And so that, uh, that, that was at the peak of where everything went wrong. And then out of that sort of came everything that went right. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Why, why Russia? Was it just want to get the fuck away Dude, I was, as far as I was possible? Just, I think I was just very drunk. Yeah. 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 That's like the most wildest thing I think I've ever said. That's crazy. Yeah. That's a crazy plan. And there was a bit of an intervention following that or? Yeah. I had some really great friends at university. In fact, I got a lot of great friends across the board uh, throughout life. So I'm super lucky in that front. Mm. But I had some friends down at um, Canterbury University who were instrumental in sort of redirecting me. Uh, which was uh, a girl named Georgia and another chick named Alice who Georgia was in the room next to me in the hall. And she's like, you just can't keep doing this stuff. And th out of that, there was some brainstorming that went on and I couldn't come up with any good ideas. So mm. Georgia and Alice were like, just go to the Paralympics. And I was like, all right. And that was it. How did you find running? Uh, I don't know. How do you find running? You run? I guess running. But <laughs> where did you see it as like a, uh, you know, potential career move for you well you want to think about the, my point of view i mean like take what i say with a grain of salt you want to kind of figure out ways to be uncompetitive mm. and find like points of differentiation where you can create value and capture a massive percentage of that value that you create and the like you can skew that to one end where you could go and like become a barista and like yep. that's what every other single person can do yeah the Paralympics just kind of made sense. Obviously, Pistorius had gone before me. It was probably the most popular event at the Paralympics. Not that I think anyone watches the Paralympics to any great extent, uh, but at least it would be a platform to me for me to go and do other things. And then around that, there was like the incentives are very positive. And it's like, show me the incentives and I'll show you the outcomes. And it's like, there's no drinking. There's mm. like, it's a, you're around great people. You yeah. join a team, yeah. all of those things. So that was very instrumental um, in me going in that direction. Yeah. Did you find throughout school and childhood, did you find it tough to continue to compete with all of the other kids who, you know, had two legs or were you still battling up, you know, against them? Because what was the oh, technology? Dude, it sucked. Horrible. Like? It was horrible. 
like at primary school uh, in a hundred meter race, <laughs> the teachers at my school like stacked the race so that the, the kind of fat kids were with the kids <laughs> with no leg. And it, <laughs> so at like 50 meters, I was in third place. My leg fell off in front of like 1200 kids. You're joking. Yeah, dude, it killed me. And uh, my mom wasn't even there. Principal like ran over with my leg, which was like five meters behind me, puts it back on. I finished the race. Just, it was like one event like that after the other, my entire childhood. And my mom showed up probably, I don't know, 15 minutes afterwards with like a roll of duct tape and like duct taped up my leg oh and my God. made me ran the 200 meters. Of course I came last. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So it was one, one sequence of embarrassing events to another sequence, yeah, you know, like swimming yeah. sports, my legs would fill up with water and I'd be fucking aqua jogging yeah yeah you know there was, none of it, there was there was no point at which i was competitive in any sport what, at, as a young person what pushed you to keep going though what, what I gave I you that never, competitive no, I, didn't. I didn't i didn't run from i never ran i only decided to run after drink driving right so yeah. that was the turning point for you massively okay okay yeah yeah well wow. and when you went to the paralympics I, I i remember watching you man and that was you just blew up completely in new zealand i remember seeing you rocking those uh I think you had like a lot, a lot longer hair back then. Unfortunately, yeah, yeah. yeah. And One chance in the world stage, and I look like that. But, but it was look. You look like a classic Kiwi. You're rocking the Pornamu on your chest, mm. um, and seeing you out there, I was actually reviewing some of the some of the footage this morning with uh, my daughter Kyla. And you know when they do the 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 panning across each of the athletes, you had this almost Conor McGregor esque about you, lifting your hands up, and just the confidence was really there. Did you see yourself? as like going into that race did you see yourself as taking out the gold medal uh you know after i won i said that i didn't but i went to the states beforehand to essentially you go through like what are trick called training camps yeah um and i went and trained with the american guys that i'd be competing against and we had these like mock races and i let those guys win uh, and it was hilarious and like they were in like classic american style thought they'd like won already mm -hmm, mm -hmm. um and i knew i could beat them so and they were second third in world rankings and i was number one so i was relatively confident yeah. that i was going to win yeah 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 um also people aren't very good under pressure i feel like i'm best under pressure mm. and as much as these guys this was to them this was everything this is the most defining moment in their lives they're at the paralympics and they've like attached all of this emotional weight to it mm. i'm like we're at my view is the self-deprecating we're at the paralympics this is ridiculous it's like a half circus show you know it's just a running race you know like none of it i'd already had too many embarrassing events to, for there to be like any sort of emotional waiting <laughs> on this you know so like for me it was it was easy it's just running around circles exactly yeah 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 how much did your life change after the paralympics very little very little really Very little yeah i mean there was certainly um like these weird asymmetric life events, right? Like I went and did New York Fashion Week. Obviously, that like flew Crazy. me over as like the diversity card. Crazy. Yeah. What was the experience like? <laughs> Bizarre. Yeah. So I was like the last one. First of all, the woman who flew me over is called Corinne Reutfeld. And she built Vogue globally. Holy shit. The very wealthy French lady. She rung me at home in Auckland. I had no idea who she was. She said, do you know anything about modeling? And I lied. And I was like, yeah. I knew nothing about modeling. And... I arrived in New York, I get to the set and uh, for a designer called Philip Plein, who's like this billionaire, super extravagant guy who hired out like this massive industrial warehouse and they filled it with snow. So like this entire catwalk was filled with snow. Real snow. I believe it was real snow. And there was a giant spaceship that came down from the building with like this massive robot that came out of it. That was like a legit robot. Holy shit with like the supermodel inside Holy so it was this shit. whole event was super extravagant there was every single celebrity you could imagine in the audience snoop dogg was there fergie and everyone crazy right? i'm the last one to walk and i'm like surely they're going to give me a, a tutorial something nothing dude and so i'm in my blades and they put me in this like little weird gimp looking suit thing it's fashion i don't know do you get any say in what, what they chuck no, you in? No, I didn't nah. know anything. Like I didn't, I just, I was like, all right. And then every other person there's like ripping a vape and just ultra cool. And so I was just totally out of place. Anyway, I'm the last one to walk out. I have no idea what I'm doing. And I take like three steps into the snow 
realize I'm fucked because I'm in my blades. Oh, no. I, the first person I look at is Snoop Dogg. Because oh, like in no. the first, first row, this guy's so baked. He sees me <laughs> in the, like the little gimp suit and my blades. I must have looked like Mr. Tumnus from the Chronicles of Narnia, bro. <laughs> Dude, I panicked. I just started running. So I started running down the, the side of like all of these models who are walking on the runway and like Corinne put her hands in it, put her head in her hands and I thought I wrecked the event and I get to the end and then the lead designer walks backstage and he's like, dude you're a genius and then i he like invites me out for the final walk with the supermodel i had no like i don't i still Holy don't really know shit. what any of that means so that was a weird event and then from that i got invited to like go have dinner with fergie no um, way. yeah it was bizarre so i get this dinner with fergie and uh it's a the reason they invite me is because it's a fundraiser for the special olympics i okay. thought i went to the special olympics not the oh paralympics i think it's all like one thing which to me i couldn't care less yeah, yeah, yeah. That, that doesn't it's bother me it's, it, yeah 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 who cares uh so that was that was hilarious um so there were events like that which are few and far between yeah. but that's not that doesn't change your life no. i think like what changes a person's life are like small habitual changes mm, day to day mm, mm. but what about the popularity that you know coming coming back you really made a name for yourself after the paralympics that's not something i ever wanted or cared and no. it's, that stuff's always fleeting yeah 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 even like the degree to which that is true for me is very minuscule relative to what's possible right so yes. it's not like i was super famous by any means mm. like i was a, a small household name mm. for a very short period of time and I knew that would eventually go. So mm. that's not something you ever want to get attached to. Nah, not at all. I was I was looking at um, a lot of you know Israel Adesanya, who's in camp at the moment, and he's got a breathing coach, and he was telling him that you need to you need to fall more in love with like the journey or the process rather than the end goal. And that's where you see you know like a lot of maybe celebrities, athletes, musicians. Once they reach that pinnacle of success, that's when they sort of come tumbling down. How did you find the sort of grind? of uh being an athlete uh i loved it you loved it yeah i love training yeah. and um i still i wish i trained more but i still train a lot now not running but just still super active mm. i don't i don't think being an athlete's as hard as well first of all being a sprinter is not hard you're, you're all you're trying to do is get the maximum stimulus response for the least amount of work possible so mm. you can like do the most again the next day mm. relative to something like fighting which you just noted with mm. israel adesanya that'd be much much harder so but i didn't find it that tough yeah 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 so just for following the sort of consistent process around it yeah and although it sucked being here in wellington trying to train in the wind oh, out mate. at newtown park that was a nightmare mate, it'd be hard to get up headwinds in every direction i think the tough part is i started running at 19 I basically went on national television. I raised fifty thousand dollars. I had no idea whether or not I would get to the Paralympics or not. So it was just like a pipe dream. Mm. It was off the back of an emotional event where I made a pretty critical mistake, and so it. I had for a good two years, no idea whether or not this would happen. Mm. That was hard. Mm. Like sticking at something that, like I grew up running and my leg would fall off. Like I had no mm. idea whether or not I was fast. I had no idea whether or not it was possible. There were just so many factors. And so for it to all pull together in three years was yeah remarkable. And were there some changes in the Paralympics uh, sort of regulations around the use of the blades? Yeah, yeah. After um, I finished competing, that was sort of off the back. That got started with Oscar Pistorius because he went to the able-bodied, for lack of a better word, the, the real Olympics. Yeah, That's yeah, what Oscar yeah, went yeah. to. And he got into the semifinals and he was extremely fast. Yeah. So everyone was thinking, well, they have a couple more improvements in blades and you're going to have these guys with no legs who kind of just come on in and they trot around the... Blast the people. Yeah, they yeah. blast people. And like, how's that fair? And it's not fair. Um, where they made some big errors, uh, and it's kind of complex to get into, but blades are essentially a medical device. You have to make them available to your competitors mm -hmm. um, commercially, mm -hmm. uh, which means they have to be regulated by the FDA. And so they set these very strict parameters about how blades could be designed, which meant the blades that I ran on would have to be redesigned. And the company that sponsored me didn't think that they could make a blade in the period of time and get it regulated by the FDA right. with a huge degree of confidence that would I'd still be as competitive. Right. And at that point, my point, my point of view is in the Paralympics, they should be allowing technology to progress continuously because mm. you're always going to have these massive deltas between developed nations and undeveloped nations where 
you have poorer countries that can't access um, you know, advanced prosthetics, yep. which is the reason that they bought these rules in, and yep. that's fair enough. Yep. But you want to let the technology progress because it has a blow-on effect into other areas of everyday life where people, like kids growing up, now mm. have really incredible feet that are off the back of the designs of things that were used in high performance in the mm. Paralympics. And so you kind of want to end up in a position where you've kind of got people in wheelchairs wearing exoskeletons, like fighting to the death, yeah, yeah, you know, yeah, with, yeah, yeah. with all sorts of crazy things going on, as opposed to like keeping people locked in a chair with wheels for the next 200 years. Yes. And so you kind of want it to turn into like the cyber freak show as opposed to, you know, so a bunch of like, disabled people using antiquated medical tools to try and mimic the real olympics mm. so, so the fundamentally sort of, i was just like no nah, i'm done yeah so the innovation really wasn't going to be there in the way that you would have liked to see it exactly yeah yeah and also i'd achieved what i wanted to achieve yeah i had no emotional attachment to being an athlete i'm a really curious person so like i would be happy as to go off and dive into something else mm. which i think a lot of people get stuck in attaching their personalities to, to their certain, profession or, yeah, to yeah. their profession or to their identity that's attached to something i couldn't care less like for whatever reason it's bizarre people in the paralympics attach their identity to being disabled yeah which is the weirdest thing to me mm. um and i'm happy going and, and doing something new so you didn't find it necessarily tough walking away absolutely not no i think you should be able to cut you want to be able to cut things early, earlier than later. Yeah. 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 How, how do you find even today um, with your identity and label around being disabled? Because, you know, you can do absolutely everything. I think it's the title of your TED talk, you know, it's turning the sort of disability mm. into your ability. And that's exactly what you've done. Like, how, how do you sort of navigate that space at the moment? Do you, Honest, get, do you get tired of it? Honestly, I just don't even care. Mm. <laughs> I think like as you grow older... Um, and like when I did that TED talk, there's a degree of your ego that's attached to labels and you care about yep. what other people, now I, I just honestly, I couldn't care less whether people called me disabled or adaptive, call me whatever you want. It, it means nothing. And, you know, for a great period of time, I did believe that being labeled as disabled probably was a strong motivator for me but ultimately i just think i'm probably just someone who likes doing things mm. <laughs> and that yeah, and yeah, that's yeah. it you know i like doing new things i like i like working hard yeah and so you just you're gonna be that person regardless yeah i don't think it's anything to do with my situation i just think like how many other sort of people who are in your situation how many other liam malones are out there who didn't choose that path well there's a lot of disabled people that you meet and uh but well sorry there's disabled people that you meet who are just like me they and i met a lot of them at the paralympics these people have no arms no legs right you're wondering how they can do anything and they have the best attitudes mm. they're hilarious they're just happy all the time then you have people who are missing a foot they're barely disabled and they're miserable they're down on life full of excuses you know they've gone to the paralympics sure whatever um but you're in a village with 10,000 other disabled people and you're talking to them all the time and you realize it has nothing to do with their disability. It just has everything to do with the attitude yeah. and just sort of like the narrative that they have going on inside their own heads. Yeah. And so I kind of came away from that realizing that all of those things, all of those external factors that you find yourself in in life, whether it's to do with you know, having a disability, whether it's you know, someone passing away, whatever challenges you're facing, mm. I think a great deal of how you deal with that adversity is just how you decide to deal with it inside mm. your own head. And mm. I think like you can choose happiness. I think it's a choice. Mm. Um, and you can always pick yourself back up. So um, there's plenty of other disabled people out there, sure, who are like miserable and they could probably be doing a whole lot more if they just... Mm decided to to do so and and just people in general right like so many people can just be dealt a fucking shit shit card of hands growing up and you can either go one or two ways you know you take that you take that route and you i hate that term you know pull pull your shoes up by the boot bootstraps but then there's other people who who rely on you know the sort of the sort of victim card and life's always happening to them yeah it's not for me dog nah no nah, nah, no fucking way nah nah no way and if that's your attitude then you always will be at an effect of everything and that's going on yep. in the world you know and it'll, if it's you'll be facing one problem today and then the next day you'll be facing another problem so yeah another problem and so it'll just be one endless you know supply of 
bad events happening to you in life and you kind of just have to get past that totally thick skin eh yeah i don't even think it's thick skin i think that's just life i think everyone now is just like a little bit soft and you know you look back 300 years ago and people had it extremely hard and they just kind of got on with things do you think it's to do with social media and we all got like a view into everyone's life and dude i have no idea maybe um i have i i I honestly wouldn't know i don't imagine it helps no no i think if you obviously are looking at a lot of other people and they have these incredible lives that probably sets false expectations Mm. relative to your own life and then you have a constant bar of an expectation that you're not living to in real time and you just kind of sit in frustration or Mm. anger or Mm. uh self-doubt whatever it might manifest itself in Mm. um but it's probably not healthy Mm. how did you find your way to like contribute to the world growing up as a young person did you did you see your limitations as a barrier no 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 uh and you know that's partly just because i'm a competitive person um but mm, the reality is is my disability is not that severe and there's a wide variety of things that you can do in life and i'm very lucky that i had uh a parent that both parents pushed me extremely hard and lord knows why they ever made me do running or swimming sports or any of those things because unless you're an idiot it's evident that that kid is not going to win and they're going to lose every single Mm. race and that's not going to be good for confidence Mm. building but it's very good for resiliency building um but then there were also just like instances even in like a soccer match where i might have like a really minor win even just in like an interaction or whatever and you realize that it's a reflection of like i've got two wooden legs growing up and i'm eight years old and so the gap isn't anything to do with me as a person it's just Mm. like a function of rocking mm. some wooden sticks his mm. legs and right? have you have you always sort of owned that or have you suffered with like oh, confidence definitely issues suffered. yeah yeah, yeah. And, definitely suffered totally yeah. especially throughout my teen years like i wore I trousers every single day for like seven years probably yeah. um but you got to get over it yeah. like at some point you have to get over it and it's a you problem yeah it's not anyone else's fucking problem it's your problem and you know i i eventually got over that nice nice um yeah, it's 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 awesome, man. Just seeing seeing your mentality towards towards all of these things. Did you experience much much bullying from any kids? Yeah, growing up, like to a degree, but then I became the bully because I'm a competitive guy, and so right. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's just how you have to roll. Like <laughs> you're not going to get bullied forever. Um, so I, that definitely was I was the case of you know how the teacher growing up was like the bullies are always the ones that yeah, got yeah, bullied. Yeah, yeah. yeah, that was probably me to be fair. Um, but also my school's just like everyone just ripped hard on each other that was the culture at my school and i kind of liked that i kind of thrived in that environment mm, um mm. and so that was that was fine for me um have you, have you ever had to spin any yarns about like the way that you've lost your legs yeah all the time <laughs> yeah. do you still do it nah oh it just requires so much energy and convincing yeah and at the end of the day you're just like deceiving someone and you get to the end of it and they're just like oh you know, yeah, there's not yeah, like yeah, any yeah. laugh or anything, but sure. Like when I was, you know, dating probably in my late teens, uh, <laughs> 18, there was like a classic instance where <laughs> my buddy, I was with two buddies, Jordan and Alex in Bali and Jordan and I spun this yarn, um, that I lost my legs to a great white off seal Island in South Africa. What a hero. Yeah, exactly. And, uh, it turned out this. This chick that I was talking to was a marine biologist. Oh, you're kidding. Yeah. And so she just like let us ramble on with this great elaborate story to get to the end and just get shut down real fast. <laughs> so, but you know, it's, it's, it just makes it fun. Yeah. 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 You know, yeah, yeah. like if you're going to have no legs, at least make it fun. Yeah. Light them on fire at school growing up, spray them with an aerosol can, you know, just make it fun. Yeah. It, you don't have to be miserable with it. They'll yep. snap all the time. Like it, it's hilarious. Yep. You know, the leg falling off. I, if I saw someone and they were doing a hundred meter race against a bunch of fat kids and their leg fell off. I would laugh. I'll lose my it's shit a, too. Yeah. It's yeah, a funny yeah, yeah, thing yeah. to happen. So yeah, I, I definitely spun some yarns. Every single thing that you can imagine lost my legs in a war whatever like i've come up with it <laughs> did um did any of them work and i can imagine it be especially in like you know your teen years was that was that hard from uh you know like dating and stuff as well 
Yeah, but like dating in my own mind more than anything, right? Yeah. And uh, like, sorry, I guess the, the doubt within my own mind. Uh, but yeah, you just, yeah, it was hard at that point in time. And then as time goes on, you realize that mm. it was silly to even worry about that in the first place. Mm, exactly. Um, we had Israel Whitley on the on the podcast. Stifler. Yeah, uh, Stifler. He, he is, dude, what a guy, eh? Had, had such a such good time on the on the yeah, body with yeah, him. Yeah, yeah, yeah. What what have you what have you learned through uh Dan Izzy? Stifler's you- the most competitive guy that I know. Um and I call him Stifler because he's like got the most energy yeah. out of anyone I've ever met in my life. And it's just like very similar to Stifler from American Pie. Um <laughs> that that's the only only reason. He's the most competitive person mm-hmm. that I know. Mm-hmm. There was a period where we would get up at 3.45 to go and jump a barbed wire fence like two years ago in the middle of lockdown and run laps uh, for no other reason than we just thought it was fun. Like, I feel sorry for people who have to compete against that guy in business. Um, he's ultra competitive. One time we went to the track and, I mean, he's had two heart attacks, right? That's right, so yeah. He probably shouldn't be running. No. And he's a healthy guy but with a bad ticker. And I don't have legs, so it's kind of balanced. Like, he might die, I might snap a leg. We don't really know how it's going to play out. Yeah, the odds are even. The odds are even. And I bet this guy, we were, we were training for a half marathon, and we were pretty similar in terms of speed. To be fair to him, he was probably a little bit quicker than I was. We did these, like, six 1K reps. First five, I beat him. The sixth rep, this just Izzy beats me in the last maybe 50 meters this guy throws his hands up throws them back there's like other people kids and families there <laughs> just trying to have like a normal training session you'd think this guy just won like a world cup or, Probably did in or his the eyes. olympics yeah he like screams across the finish line <gasps> let's go let's go it just it's unbelievable he's got a lot of energy yeah. um he's really passionate about uh, his work and his employees and getting the most out of people, most out of his friends. He's mm. a, I would describe Izzy as a bar raiser mm. as an individual. Uh, he'll hold you to account. And then if you don't hold him to account, he'll hold you to account for not, not holding, holding him, him to account. account. So he's, he's a fantastic guy. Um, and I knew Izzy when he started, you know, when he was probably two or three years in team of four, maybe. And, uh, he was extremely confident then mm. and he was making it up as he went along to some extent back then because he was learning and, and trialing and mm. now he's at a point where he's got a whole lot of systems in place and he's scaling and he's doing an incredible job and he's just, yeah, he's a great guy and a, a phenomenal, phenomenal leader. Yeah, yeah. He was telling me a story when when he was on the potty about his father. He like lost a really tough game of football. I think they lost like 1-0 or 2-1. And the the final whistle went and he went to go walk up to his dad and he just saw his dad hopping in the car and driving off. Gone. He just gone. What? Yeah, that's yeah. the thing. And he came back home. He's like, I don't fucking take home losers, you know? Yeah. And I, I wonder if that was a sort of tipping point for that guy having that really, I guess, competitive nature and drive. No idea. But I can tell you what, he is the most competitive person that I know. Do you guys flat together? Or you used to? No, we used to. We did for a period of time. He starts work probably maybe 5 a.m., maybe 5.30, but he's up at like 4.30 most mornings. Hey, man. 4.30, shower turns on, which is above my room. Drum and bass at 4.30 in oh, the morning. Oh, you're kidding. This guy sings in the shower like he's in a nightclub at 4.30 <laughs> in the morning. I've never met anyone like him. It's, it's yeah. The whole, everything's always a competition. It's hilarious. That's so good. You walk into, walk into my room. You know, right as I'm trying to go to sleep, flick of the light switch for like five minutes yeah, until, yeah, you know, yeah. I get out of bed to lose it at him. But he's, yeah, he's, he's awesome. We're all just little kids at heart, I reckon. He's the biggest little kid. Yeah. Yeah. Man, that is insane. Um, uh, I was also wondering uh, what sort of principles have running given you into your everyday life, you know? That's a great question. Definitely consistency. Um, like you realize, for example, with running, I had no idea what I was doing. I just started. And the first day I ran, I didn't have blades or anything. I ran in my normal walking prosthetics wow. across in the field from my university hall. And because I went on television, tried to raise $50,000 and money started flowing into my bank account. My friend's like, dude, you're actually going to have to do this. And I'm thinking to myself, 
fuck man i am actually going to have to do this so with that like anxiety of having that pressure mm. i just went and started running no idea what i was doing and that eventually with momentum and learning eventually ended up in me becoming a world champion and that was a very long and slow process but looking back it happened quite quickly yeah so i think great things can happen from very small steps at the beginning yep um just by being consistent day in day out yep um surrounding yourself with I mean, it's really basic principles, like surrounding yourself with really great people with bar raises. Totally. Um, the Izzy's of the world. The Izzy's of the world and just having great coaching around you. I was super fortunate in that regard. Um, experimenting, thinking outside the box was a massive one. I was under like a massive time constraint. Like the guys that I was going up against were, had been competing for probably seven years, right? So wow. they had a physical advantage on me um, and thinking about how we could make adaptations with the blades in order to succeed yeah was part of succeeding yeah so i think thinking outside the box getting a little bit creative not having standard strategies not strategizing too much you know just getting out and doing it yeah that, that makes a massive difference all of those things mm. that can be the hardest thing for for many people eh? it's just actually getting started like building up that momentum to getting to out of do your things. own head's the biggest one 100 percent. yeah 100 and the real you gotta just gotta accept that in the first like year to two years you're just going to be fumbling yeah. the whole way yeah. you know fumbling's like starting at the top of a mountain and you're just fumbling the whole way down mm. um i think one of the other big ones is just alcohol like i don't not i i enjoy a wine i enjoy a cider but like limiting exposure to that has mm. been huge for me so um, ingrained into our culture as well it's almost it's hard to escape right yeah yeah and like everyone loves a beer and i think it's a great yeah. social lubricant yeah and but uh for me definitely just like mm, it not being the core focus of my life every weekend mm. have you done like a dry july before dude i've been pretty much dry for a very long period of time i nice. mean i drink occasionally for sure but yeah i would have done nine months straight multiple times damn yeah inspiration no it's not it's not even hard to me it is yeah yeah you like a beer <laughs> oh, that's mate. fair enough a yeah, couple and, of wet ones on a saturday yeah and fair enough too um but you know equally i'd probably gone through phases where i'm like smashing way too much coffee and i think that's probably as bad in some ex to yeah, some extent you yeah, know? yeah yeah the caffeine the caffeine the caffeine jitters gets you the jets because yep. of the anxiety so yeah i don't know i think everything in moderation to some extent you transitioned from um you know being an athlete and then took a took a stint at, at comedy um are you still in enough fuck I, no what, what's it like man i went to my Horrible. first comedy stand-up comedy gig just to watch yeah i'd say about Painful, two months glass. ago fuck it was so cringe yeah seeing these is. people that's, that's what it's like when you start out but so cringe but also so fucking funny you feel yeah you feel, yeah well, what, so how what, many people were like? in the audience oh it must have been about 20 yeah so that's probably not an audience it's like just like a group of people yeah so there's like a tipping point for one where you kind of stop just being yourself and you become like a group of people. And so there's like a reactive laugh that happens. And then you kind of just get into a, a momentum of laughing. That is what it's like when you start comedy. I did it for maybe like nine months in mm. London alongside work. Um, I did the Edinburgh Fringe Festival. Crazy. And I like signing up to stuff like that. You know, it makes life fun. Uh, yeah, you walk into a bar. There's five people in a bar that don't know you're going to be telling jokes. Uh, seven people who aren't funny get up and tell jokes for five minutes each. The people at the bar trying to eat their dinner, they don't laugh thing what the fuck is going on you go home and cry yourself to sleep and do it again and you know it's super interesting because that's how everyone starts and uh i got a lot of friends who still do it yeah they started out and they were horrendous and now they're really good and i don't think it's a function of being funny as a person i think it's probably like mm. everything else and it's more of an art form that you can just get better at and grind and grind and grind um in london you see uh professional comics that you would have seen on netflix go up in front of audiences and they honestly just read jokes out from their bits of paper that they've written up and they just put a tick next to it or wow. like a half tick as if it's funny half funny needs work wow. and and you know falls like falls down not funny at all and so for them you can just see that it's <clears throat> for the most part and there's like a methodology and just like formulating yeah right a script of what what is funny so it's almost like data data mining so you do all your yeah totally yeah yeah with a with a strong degree of like I think great comics have like some sort of artistic intuition yeah. that allows them to be way better than anyone else. Yeah. How did you find when you might like bomb on stage and stuff? Is that like the most nah, disgusting nah, feeling you've ever felt? Not as bad as having your leg fall off and 
in front of 1200 kids yeah i could say that yeah yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> no nah, it's yeah it's hard um but it's not the end of the world are you, are you still doing comedy? No, fuck no. You should get back into <laughs> nah, it, man. I couldn't think anything worse. I reckon you could overtake. Like, who's the biggest comic in NZ? Guy Williams? Uh, I have no idea. My, my, the comics that I like would be very different to what the New Zealand public likes, probably. Who, who do you listen to? Like some Andrew Schultz? Schultz is great. Yeah. That form, probably. The, on the darker side, right? Yeah, That's, yeah, yeah. I think, what you shouldn't joke about is typically the funniest. So. Totally. Yeah. Yeah, Sh- Schultz is good. Mark Norman. Yeah, he's, he's hilarious. Funny. Yeah. yeah, all of those guys, he's, that kind of motley crew of yeah. degenerates. He's almost got that sort of old school way of telling jokes. I don't he know does. what it is, but yeah. it's just... Yeah. Well, he's a one-liner. Yeah, he's kind yeah of one-liner, that's punchy, right. punchy, whereas everyone yeah. else is still storytelling and everything like that. Yeah. Um, yeah, he's hilarious. Uh, Gervais is good, although I thought Supernature wasn't that good. But no, I, think, I didn't dig that too much either. Yeah. Um, I don't think it helped him because he kind of performs... More like a, almost like a um, theater show. Mm. More than a comedian who's like worked bars and worked audiences he doesn't know. He kind of almost looks like he creates an entire script. Yeah. From start to finish. Yeah. Performs it, sharpens it, and that's what you get. Whereas a lot of comics, even though they're kind of working through specific jokes, they're doing it in the bars of people that they don't necessarily know and so like it's always going to be exceptionally funny so i think maybe but who knows yeah i think he's fucking hilarious though. yeah yeah, yeah. he's good um i'd say probably the my most favorite comedy skit which i've ever seen has got to be jim jeffrey's bit on gun control hilarious yeah. it, like you look at that it's Classic. just an absolute piece of ass eh? yeah it's um and it's to an american crowd as well which i think is like the cheer well, i think top. it was a southern american crowd too which Even is crazy you know pro gun um yeah, he's hilarious. Yeah, he's bloody good. So what are you up to now, bro? What are you, what are you doing for yourself? Yeah, I work at Amazon Web Services. Yep. It's AWS, which is part of Amazon.com, uh, which is obviously, as you noted, founded by Jeff Bezos. Huge beast of an organization. Uh, it's epic. You can just think about it in the most basic ways. Like most things that touch the internet mm. uh, will probably have some connection to Amazon Web Services. So we're uh, currently building or currently investing something like 7 billion into New Zealand to build a massive data center. Holy shit. Uh, and yeah, I mean, m- most things that are sort of built on the cloud these days will be built on AWS. Yeah. Well, I didn't, I never even knew Amazon like branched into that sort of space. Yeah. And I can't speak a huge amount to it, but essentially it is a byproduct of all the infrastructure that amazon.com was built on. They built internally. And then they began offering that to their customers because right. it's world class. You know, Amazon is a behemoth of, an, of a of a company. It's huge. Um, and to be able to provide those services that they use internally to customers, yeah, is epic. Yeah. So they build tool, tooling internally for themselves, and then they're able to ship it to customers, and that's pretty exceptional. What 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 are your thoughts on uh your your founder and Grace Jeff Bezos like incredible yeah what does he do with his time like what no does that idea. man do I've got no idea I could just imagine him like investing in like anti aging like technology I don't I'm gonna think live he's, forever no I don't think he's that guy I think that's a Peter Thiel right. type character uh I think he spends a great deal of his time now focused on the climate pledge yeah he's done is, a lot of money to that eh? yeah totally so I think looking at uh, renewable energy production storage and um figuring out how to lower lower carbon um production as a byproduct of manufacturing mm. and and consumption of the goods and services we use in the economy i yeah. think that's pretty much what he dedicates all of his time to and then the rest of it would be blue origin i would imagine yeah man just getting to space man's absolutely jacked as well at the moment absolutely he's yoked <laughs> he's super yoked it's awesome to see he um yeah he's obviously i think training to go to space yeah yeah that's crazy um do you have any other like do you have any other pull or uh like is there a part of you that would ever consider returning back to athletics nope nope none, not at all? N- none. zero zilch it's a very restrictive lifestyle mm. being an athlete you're confined to your set training hours which i guess is not that dissimilar to having a set job but then it's everything else like you can't eat you, what, what you can eat is very restrictive. Yeah. You're always super paranoid about the competition, which yeah. I guess is true in you know, other industries as well, but um, it's more than a full-time job. It's like it consumes your life. And 
while it was a great platform alongside university to go and do other things, it would not be a suitable platform as a you know twenty eight year old mm. who's you know trying to have a successful career. Mm. You don't make a huge amount as an athlete. No. And money's not everything, but it's a thing and it's a significant thing. And so you should think about that in my point of view. Yeah. Um, and you don't want to make that transition later on in life. No, no, nah, not at all. It'll be a bit harder, eh? Um, when you met like Fergie and the rest of the sort of A-list celebs, what was that experience like? Did you get to actually catch up, catch up with them at all? Oh, I sat next to Fergie at dinner. Unreal. Yeah, it was Fergie, Kareen, uh, this photographer named Stephen. This began with the F. I can't quite remember. Uh, and he's super famous as well. Like he's photographed every celebrity. Um, and Kareen put me in their magazine, which was like called CR Quarterly or something, which is what she did after Vogue. Uh, what was it like? Honestly, anticlimactic. You kind of have a conversation. You're not sure why you're there. You know, it's weird. So did she point you out at the catwalk and was like, I want him tonight? Fergie and Kareem were sitting together. Lord, I've got no idea. Kareem, her, I've got no clue. Unreal. Bizarre though. That Very so bizarre. Crazy. Yeah. I remember I saw Fergie perform. She opened for the police like years ago right. when they came to Wellington and she did her whole set, her whole performance of her fly undone. I was like nine years old. I was like, what? What is going on? <laughs> yeah, what's happening? Too much coke. Exactly. Probably, most yeah. likely. Yeah. Um, what, are you, what are your parents like, man? Because I can imagine for them at the age of 18 months when they had to make the decision to amputate, mm. you know, like do, do you see a lot of your own values in, in your old man and in your mum? Not really. Uh, I think I'm my own person. Mm. I think that they definitely gave me um, very valuable uh i guess attitudes towards hard work determination yep. those things but I, I think i'm very different from them um in a lot of ways like i think generationally our generation like people like yourself doing this podcast you're searching for some sort of asymmetric outcome right mm. like this could get scale mm -hmm. you don't know how big this could become their generation looked for security safety consistency you know maybe as we go into a recession our generation will look for that too yeah uh so in that regard it's probably not my mom was definitely a battler. Like she was even six months before she was going to die. She was out on the farm every single day working. If she saw my dad doing something, cause he's not like a farming person. He's like a corporate guy. He would, she would lose it and she would go and do it. And she's like near death. Right. And she'd be like, all right, this is just painful to watch. I'm yeah, just going to yeah. do this. And she wasn't a farmer either by any means, but at least she would just get stuck in and get it done. Mm. So just having that like rigid determination obsession of getting things done. I've definitely inherited. Uh, yeah, I mean, like, I found out recently I had a secret family. So What does that mean? Oh, yeah, not my kid, thankfully. But my dad had classic story, like a family in the Philippines, didn't know about. So I've got a younger brother who's Holy five. Holy shit. Um, yeah, wild. So that's, Who's five? Yeah. So this is quite, like, recent. Oh, yeah. So I didn't know about my younger brother for two years. It's a crazy story. Um, that epic. They all now live in Nelson. Awesome. Amazing. Hard adjustment, and then you kind of, yeah, you get over those things. Um. Yeah, so I got a little brother named Tyler. That's he's cool, absolutely man. gorgeous. He's super bright and he's very hardworking and like very helpful yeah. around the house, which is like hilarious, like really, really helpful. Um, and uh, dad's partner is just an absolute worker. So um, that's really cool to see as well. That's crazy. We, just East, East Asian culture, man. They yeah, grind. They, they do, grind right? so hard. Yeah. Yeah. So much harder than what we do. Our expectation of hard work and their expectation of hard work are very different. Totally different. Yeah. We had um, sort of quite a similar thing happen, happen in our family. You know those like ancestry tests that you can do? Yeah. Um, my uh, nana, she's always been into genealogy. So we got her one of those tests on, our birthday, on her birthday. She did it, but she's not really tech savvy. So she didn't download the app and stuff. But my auntie did the same test and she could see that you know, through the app that um, her mum, my nana had also done it, done the test. But she had this random connection to this guy in Australia um, who was like 20, I think four, 25. Um, and they started messaging and it was saying that they should be like, this sort of like a nephew relationship um, in terms of like how they share their DNA. And it turns out this guy in Australia, Stephen, he's, you know, never known his dad. Um, his mum passed away when he was three and he's just on this platform trying to connect with his lost family if they're out there or not. So it started this massive conversation between my dad's brothers 
uh, all of my uncles around who might have been in Australia 24 years ago that got a girl pregnant and just, you know, never, never knew. knew. And you wouldn't know. No, if you no, no, not back then. Did like a one night stand, you go back home, you didn't get the girl's number or anything. Like, how are you supposed to know? And I think I went to my dad first. He was like 12 or something at a time. So he got off scot free. Went to another one of my uncles. He was married at the time. We're like, you dirty dog, if that was you. Um, but then went to my other uncle. Um, who, you know, has always been searching, you know, probably hasn't, he's always been searching and trying to get his life on, on the right track. And he's, he doesn't have any kids. As soon as we saw a photo of this guy, Stephen, we're like, mate, that's your son. So we got him to do the test and turns out that's his, that's oh, his boy. Oh, no way. <laughs> it's crazy. So they and if they re rekindled and- Yeah, they, oh. all, they all came over. So he's got kids. Um, Stephen's got kids and they all came over for my 21st, um, which is awesome. It was Wild. cool, man. It was that's crazy. That's an incredible story. You just think- Are they similar? Um, they look very similar. I probably haven't spent enough time with Stephen to like understand no. his personality. Yeah. He's like a mean league player. Yeah. Uh, I, I, yeah, I'm, it, it is so crazy. It is so crazy. Just wonder how many other people out there like uh, waiting to I think to those ancestry tests are ripping families apart, dude. Bro, I bet. Yeah. I bet. Yeah. I still don't know how I feel about like sending my data off to some lab in fucking Norway and yeah, what they yeah. do. Yeah, in it. retrospect, it seems insane. Some Black, Black Mirror episode yeah, for yeah, sure. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. yeah. I'm with you on that one. I never thought about that until Black Mirror came out. I'm like, I should not have done 23 and Me. So, but hey, what can you do? What can you do? Um, what what's like on, on the horizon for you for you, man, in the next sort of like five to ten years? Something I love doing with guests is trying to, you know, potentially get them to commit to setting a goal on the podcast. Like what do you want to do in the next, you know, five to ten years? What do you well, want to do? Something achieve? fun that I'd like to achieve is getting two hundred skydives under my belt. Damn. And I'm at fifty something at the moment. And that would be ideal, but New Zealand's conditions aren't necessarily the greatest for like learning to skydive. Yeah. So I'll probably have to go overseas and do that. That's kind of like a fun, easy one. Uh, I have my own like personal wealth goals. Yep. Uh, and I think that's extremely important to me. Mm. Um, so, you know, continuing to find good, good companies at fair prices and mm. investing in those for long periods of time, I think is, is, you know, extremely important. Um, yeah, I don't know what else. What's, um, what was it like doing your first solo skydive? That seems fucking crazy. I was sweet. The chick that I did it with had sensory overload and she just curled up and like, bombed it no yeah and so like the aff instructors you you watch them jump out and she jumped out in front of me and they like have to dive after her they're trying to like communicate with her and then they pull her ripcord you have something internally that like once you get under 2500 feet and you haven't pulled it it will automatically deploy so you're safe it's pretty reassuring that's very reassuring but not reassuring when you like curl up in a ball because mm. if you don't open your parachute and your like body's in the correct position mm. that's when it gets a little bit hairy so I, honestly i just found it to be super fun mm. i didn't find it to be scary at all i think it's the funnest thing i've ever done hands down as a solo skydive doing backflips and stuff in the ears Bro, that's crazy. yeah it's, it's super fun so i would recommend that to anyone it's so much more fun than doing a tandem yeah 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 i, I fuck i don't know if i trust myself eh, to pull the nah, thing. you'd be sweet i reckon i'll crap out no nah, you wouldn't you'd be fine <laughs> it's honestly fine you're floating in the air what do you have to do you know you hang out a little bit you Rip a cord. Yeah. How hard can it be? I just freak out, I reckon. Do you do any adventure sports or anything? Um, not adventure sports. I've just signed up. I'm just doing jujitsu. Started start this year, which is good fun. Fucking the most humbling thing you could ever do. Where are you doing it? Uh work, workshop jujitsu in town. Oh, um I'm not up sure. Victoria Street. Uh, it just yeah. opened up quite recently. Um Who's leading it? Do you know? It's this guy called Pat and Amy. So mm. Amy was like one of the first female black belts in New Zealand. Um, and Pat's been a black belt for years as well. Um, it's cool. Yeah, they're husband and wife and just absolutely live and breathe jits. Do you know Vanderson Pyrus? Does no, that ring a bell? No. Nah. Uh, combat room? Does that oh, ring I know a bell? Combat, yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah. I did jiu-jitsu for like nine months. Most humbling thing ever. I was oh, getting 100%. choked out by like seven-year-old kids and 10-year-old kids. Yeah, man. It was crazy. Yeah. Yeah. I, I think that's what just keeps me coming back and you can roll with the white belts and when you get a few submissions under your belt, you're like, yeah, your ego starts talking to you. You're like, yeah, man, I'm the man. I can do this to anyone. And then you roll with somebody else, even another white belt who knows what they're doing. Um, and you just get, you turn into, yeah, you just get absolutely I never even got bitch. to that point. I oh, don't man. think I ever made anyone tap. Anytime we were rolling, I was getting crushed. I never had any, like if you are <clears throat> on the bottom and, like I never had like my full, I can't be my foot. Yeah. So I couldn't like push down on the ground to like sweep yeah, and get true. out from, you know, like I was just 
trapped. Would would you? I was the e easiest target ever. But you couldn't do any footlocks on you. No, that's a good point. Yeah. But I think you're a goddamn yeah. advantage here. There's a dude in Wellington who's like, uh, I don't know what bout he is, but he wins heaps of the competitions. He's blind. Right. Like how amazing is that? One He's of those blind... spooky people who have like adjusted and kind of like got an advantage yeah. from a lack of a let up, yeah, a lack, lack of, of eyesight. It is insane. And he imagine, so you, you think it's humbling getting tapped out in jits anyway. Imagine getting tapped out by a blind person. Yeah, that'd be horrendous. That'd be terrible. I'd be hanging up the belt. Yeah, exactly. So, do you do any other adventure nah, sort of sports nah. or? Nah, I've just bought a new downhill mountain bike or Man. enduro bike. But apart from that, there's nothing. Yeah, I just work. Like you only get a certain amount of time for so mm. many hobbies. Had golf for a little bit. Izzy and I were playing a fair bit of golf. Never got under 100. So I'm fucking rubbish at it. Yeah, I went out with my girlfriend hard, to the bro. driving range and she can like drive further than I can. No, that's painful. Yeah. Don't tell people that one. Oh, dude, I just did. Um, yeah, it hurts. It is what it is, though. Yeah. What's, cool. your, what's your advice around, or do you have any hot tips around um, investing, bro? No. No? I don't think you should listen to people. Yeah, I do actually. Don't listen to investing advice from people on a podcast. Probably. Uh, unless they are incredible. Unless obviously, they're Liam alone, I no, think. No, definitely don't listen to my investing advice. The simplest, like, obviously there's like the general advice that gets put out there, which I think is probably true. I don't think the average person knows how to time a market. I mm. don't think the average person can probably identify decent companies at fair prices. Yeah. And so in that regard, you're probably better off, like, uh, you're probably better off having either a, a financial advisor not so that they necessarily can pick equities for you but because i think so much of investing is probably temperament yep. and people get panicked and they move with markets kind of yep. like a fish in the tide and so yeah when things are at an absolute peak they kind of have feel like a stock has or an equity has a, a promise to them to mm. continuing to go up and then obviously you have events where central banks raise rates and things get repriced um and so you're probably better off finding a cheap index and investing in that over a very long period of time. Mm. And you're going to do very, very fine, especially in a company like a country like America, which is filled with exceptional people, exceptional people from around the world continue to want to yep. move there. And they continue to produce and export the world's greatest products and services. Yeah. That country is going to do well forever. Yeah. Probably best to just buy S and P 500 or something. Perhaps. Yeah. 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 But don't take my advice. No, don't take any financial <clears throat> advice from the this way, podcast. The, the way that I the way that I invest is just to try and find like reasonable um assets at at fair prices. Yeah. 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 And like if things go down, they go down and that's probably a good thing because if you're a net buyer of anything, you kinda want it to go down in periods of time. You obviously don't want it to go down forever if it's equities, but you know, for a short period of time. If you're gonna be buying that for a long period of time, mm. if it goes down that, you should be happy mm. because you can buy more at a lower price. Totally. Bit of a sale. Um, do you like dedicate a portion of your pay towards towards investing? Yeah, historically I did. Yeah. Um, right now, I'm just sitting on cash and waiting. I think we're probably maybe halfway through the correction. Yeah. So I think you've obviously had multiples compress. Um, I don't know if you know what the bullwhip effect is in supply chains. Yeah. Um, so you'll probably end up with um, massive earnings compression as well, I mm. think, globally. And then so asset prices, again, will have to come down. Mm. I'm not a forecaster. I couldn't tell you what anything was going to do from, from tomorrow or the, the next week, but maybe like another mm. 40%. Mm. So once everything gets repriced to being fairly valued, then I think it's yeah. a good time to, to continue buying, buying equities. Has crypto been the biggest Ponzi scheme to ever exist? Or is oh, there truth in it? Uh, well, I think it's good that things are, you have things that are experimental. Yeah. Um, I would separate Bitcoin from the rest of them. Yeah. Um, and I think that's for like a number of reasons. When it was founded uh, Satoshi by, by Satoshi, who we don't even know who that guy is, is that? Oh, yeah, or they, but or probab they. probably a singular person. Um, there was no pre-mine, you know, unlike something like Ethereum, where the early founders um, and, I guess, employees of the foundation and investors were allocated a percentage of the ETH supply, um, which creates, like, a perverse set of incentives. Bitcoin was secured day dot 
from Satoshi mining from the Genesis block um, and had no advantage over anyone else that began to mine it. So they were obviously mining it on some PCs back then because the, mm. the hash, um, hash rate was super low, so it was really uncompetitive. Um, you could mine it on like a laptop. Uh, and so I think it probably resembles something similar to like a digital gold yeah um but the rest of it i think are pretty dubious mm. obviously i think nfts are the biggest scam oh mate ever. i don't fucking i still can't get my head around why someone yeah. would purchase like a digital copy of something and i understand you can have like different different benefits to it because it's on the blockchain it verifies who it is you could have like for like a membership that you could see benefits in that but like, I feel yeah, like it's just the, like a flex, you know? Well, you run through the use cases and people are like, yeah, but you can put like a property transaction on the blockchain and use smart contracts. And I think people often don't really know what they're saying when they, when they mean that. And when it comes back to it, the only way to really enforce those things is through a traditional means by having lawyers in place, having something in an escrow, mm. um, and being able to apply local laws mm. to enforce that contract because yeah. there's some sort of like code um that doesn't mean that the code is law yeah so it's kind of it's kind of a little bit dumb but yeah. if you're young and like you're putting all of your net worth into crypto off you know be careful yeah be careful but like let people do what they want right like i had a ton of friends who lost a ton of money in luna a ton of money that's the one that fully crashed right <clears throat> that was a total that was the most like similar ponzi scheme to the madoff like bernie madoff's scheme wow. where he's like taking new money from uh taking money from new investors to pay other investors and it's just like one giant mm. pile of nonsense mm. and that's really what what luna and terra were Fuck. yeah which is wild like i have friends who've lost hundreds of thousands oh of my dollars. god you just feel like the biggest idiot hey yeah but you know that's life and they're young and they can rebuild it's not the end of the world but geez, just swindled they got swindled totally swindled yeah um hey we'll wrap up with just a few quick fire questions um before we do that where can people keep up with you and your mahi liam where's the best way to get in touch well i'm not someone who really puts a whole lot out there uh but, but you can follow me on instagram if you want but you're not going to see anything exciting so that's <laughs> uh, just liam malone yeah liam malone yeah with an with an extra m in between the, the liam and the malone nice love it uh cool what is the meaning of life uh probably figuring out what the right question to ask is which mm. is hitchhiker's guide to the galaxy but otherwise i don't know Yep. What brings you true happiness? Uh, oof, that's a difficult philosophical question. Honestly, hanging out with my dog and my girlfriend nice. brings me a ton of happiness. Yeah, man. Yeah. Keep it simple. Um, we'll see what yarns you got for this one. Your worst first date story. Ooh, oh, I probably have loads. Um, I have been on a number of dates where they had no idea that I had artificial legs and that's an extraordinarily <laughs> tough like uh, scenario to be in when they try to play footsies with you and they don't know. Oh my God. Dude, yeah. Dude, how does that, how does that pan out? Like what, what happens? Well, obviously I can't play footsies back. You know, I'm like going to kick them in the shin and it's, it's just, it's just extremely awkward. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. They're like, that doesn't feel like flesh. It's um, so like, why are you so cold? Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> um, that that's there's at least like five of those scenarios apart from that then you go on like dates where the you know like a girl might have done research on you like i went on a date once and this girl thought i was like super into rogan and i am into mm. rogan as much as like the next next guy would ever have listened to his podcasts but mm. i was like super clear that she thought i was like this giant rogan super fan and it was just like tailoring herself to meet what she might have thought my ideal was and it was really weird right yeah just so like not just, being herself right yeah, she's that, like that, that talking was about super fucking awkward. elk meese and shit just yeah, really. yeah, yeah 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 exactly exactly <laughs> and nootropics and whatever um <laughs> alpha brand yeah i don't know apart from that i've been in relationships so yeah nice mm, man not a, not a huge amount of stories to share no no those ones are good uh advice you wish you knew about when you were younger uh the you know, the big one definitely for me was like at school and high school, I never did extremely well, definitely capable, but never did extremely well. And I guess my, my general view is that what you learn at school and at university are not particularly relevant for the real world. Mm. And the people that teach you and their expectations and what they think are like worthwhile pursuits aren't necessarily good benchmarks. 
And so you kind of just have to figure out like ways to create value and capture it. Mm. And it is very much the opposite of what you learn at university with like strategies and plans and everything else. It's like literally just getting out there, trying things. And if you see that it works like a little bit, then dive a little bit deeper and yeah. push a little bit harder in that and try and improve it and, and see if that goes somewhere. Yeah, man. Bloody good. Um, if you could change one thing in New Zealand, what would this be? You know, I'm really not for changing things and, and pushing things on other people. Uh, but I would probably, um, go for like i'm not going to point to any particular industry or anything but less regulation in general nice yeah less less rules less rules yeah. anarchy let's do it maybe not anarchy but the purge oh would you if <laughs> I'd there was survive. the purge I'd, you, I'd, I'd survive but would you purge uh i don't know i mean are we i don't know i'd probably vote for leaving out of town True. Yeah. So, like, somebody fucks you off in the week. You but I be suppose like, the way to think about it is everyone in the purge purges for the most part, right? I mean, right. I, I can't remember, but I believe that's true. So the probability is you'd probably purge. I wonder. Imagine if that happened. I feel like you know the probably first year. Probably not far off. Dude. Nah, the I, way I reckon like are going. the first year it would be like ten deaths in the purge, and then every year it would just go up. Like people just get more normalized to like killing people, scaling it. Yeah, yeah. coming up with more wildly destructive ways I to know. murder a bunch of people. Yeah, probably not for me. It'd be a good time to like get into home security though, if they ever does. True. As a business. Watch out. Once a year though, you know? Yeah. Uh, what do you believe is the main thing that is holding back young people in New Zealand? Too much focus on credentialism mm. by far, which mm. is like these very tracked pathways to doing things. Um, like I don't think you need to go to university to go into sales or marketing for most jobs in technology. I think mm. a lot of young people could probably leave school at like 14, 15 and enter the workforce and be super competent. Mm. And I think having, you know, an extra decade of going to like advanced, you know, baby care pretty much is what I kind of see like later schooling years as. And then university where you take on a ton of debt without really knowing what you're buying mm. is probably not a good start in life. And I think having an extra decade to experiment uh, in different jobs would probably be more helpful. Mm, yeah. That's a good point, man. I agree. As somebody who hasn't gone to university, and has just been grinding from like the practical exactly. side of things. Exactly. Um, it makes no difference. I, I went to university. Yeah. Uh, no. Do you think it? Do you think the education system and university helped you get to where you are no, today? No, absolutely not. No. Zero. Zilch. Wow, that's crazy. Yeah. Eh? I mean, I had two speeches at uni. I had like the speech that I gave, which is, um, yeah, I didn't want to like rain on anyone's parade. But you don't know what you're buying when you go to university. Mm. Like there's kind of like a general saying in technology. It's like, are you buying a consumption good? So, you know, are you going there to party for four years, make a bunch of friends? Yeah. Then are you really getting like an education? So is that what you're purchasing or are you purchasing an insurance good? So if like society falls apart and you have a recession, do you not fall through the cracks? That's well, right. That doesn't even really help anymore. No. Nah. Um, are you buying an investment, an investment good that kind of like increases your chance of getting into a good role at a great company probably not anymore mm. everything's kind of done on a proof of work basis like can you show me a, a body of work that's actually useful totally so i don't think it's a great litmus test for finding people that are productive or hard working i think it's extremely easy to game and everyone does it so i don't think it's a great differentiator mm. so i don't think it's helped me one bit i think pursuing the paralympics was a good example of doing something that was gonna open more doors for me mm. yeah you heard it here, Victoria University graduate, <laughs> dropping yeah. the bombs. Yeah. <laughs> um, cool. We'll just close off with a, with a quick quote before we uh, wrap things up. This is by, I've used one of the, this guy's quotes before, but I thought it was fitting. Um, the bad motherfucker, David Goggins. Um, I love that guy. He is the man. I thought you might appreciate it. Izzy and I went through a massive phase, even when, like when we were running and we were running hard all the time, we were just go to the track and he'd be yelling through the speakers Dude, you know while nothing we're cracking. Better, eh? yeah, who's gonna carry the boats that's who's like my favorite yes yeah. okay my happiness is my reflection on the suffering during my journey and knowing that i never quit or nor was i guided by anybody on this earth the man cheers Liam. legend Thanks, thank mate. you so much bro